Yeah. See that okay? So welcome everybody to the uh, second half of the um, ASN Vice Presidential Symposium. So we'll have uh, two talks and then hopefully people will stick around for a discussion section. Um, so we're going to start with Liana Zoller talking about phenological shifts in plants and pollinators over a century disrupt interaction persistence. Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks all for being here. And again, thanks, Lauren, for organizing this great symposium. Um, yeah, welcome, everyone. So as Lauren said, my name is Leanna Zoller. I'm working in Julian Versasco's lab at the University of Colorado Boulder. And yeah, I'm excited to talk to you about phenological shifts and um, implications for persistence of species interactions. So first things first, pollinators are essential in my very biased opinion. They play a critical role in the reproduction of the majority of flowering plants. Uh, in fact, about 90% of wild plant species and 70 75% of the world's important crops depend on animal pollinators. Therefore, pollination is um, an ecosystem that is crucial for maintaining biodiversity, ecosystem functioning, and um, our food security. So in order to preserve this ecosystem service, we ideally want to ensure the long-term stability in plant pollinator interactions. Um, however, I'm sure you all heard about it, pollinators and their associated plants are declining globally. And this is driven by a range of anthropogenic factors, including land use change and cl climate change. As we know, climate change is causing shifts in temperatures and precipitation patterns all over the world. And one significant consequence of these changes is the alteration of phenology. Um, that is the timing of biological events such as flowering or the emergence of insects. Um, for example, let's assume our baseline condition is that a certain plant begins flowering at the same time a pollinator emerges. These species then overlap in time and can therefore interact with each other. However, if the plant begins to flower earlier in the year, for example, due to warmer temperatures or earlier snow melt, but their pollinator does not adjust its life cycle accordingly, they might not overlap in time. This can disrupt the interaction between the species and lead to a phenological or temporal mismatch. And when phenological mismatches occur, it can have cascading implications for the ecosystem. So if pollinators are not available when plants flower, this can lead to a lower seed set or fruit set, and therefore to a re re reduced plant reproduction, which can eventually affect also other organisms that depend on those plants for resources. So to understand and predict the impacts of climate change on phenology and species interactions, long-term data are necessary as it can take decades or even centuries for the effects of climate change to become apparent. Uh, however, most studies on plant pollinator interactions currently span one to four years. So this short duration limits our ability to detect and understand long-term trends. And one approach to bridge this data gap is by utilizing historical data. So for the study I'm talking about today, we took advantage of a rare historical data set recording plant pollinator interactions from over 100 years ago, um, which we then are comparing to data from a recent resurvey. So this comparison allows us to get a long-term perspective on changes in phenology of plant and pollinator species, and to also examine potential implications on the way they interact. Specifically, we asked two main questions. First, how did the phenology of plant and pollinator species change across time periods? And second, does change in temporal overlap of interacting species predict the persistence of interactions? 
So before I'm showing you some preliminary results on these questions, I want to introduce you to our study region and our past and present data sets. So this is Pikes Peak. Uh, it's located in the Colorado Rocky Mountains and with an elevation of 4,302 meters, it's the highest summit of the Southern Front Range of the Rockies. Pikes Peak is uh, located in the Pikes National Forests and parts of which belong to the National Wilderness Preservation System, meaning that they are designated for preservation in their natural condition. So generally speaking, um, this area has seen quite little change in land use in the past decades and centuries. However, as many places, Colorado and likely the regions around Pikes Peak have seen climatic changes during the last century. So this is a graph borrowed from the Colorado Climate Change Vulner Vulnerability Study that was published in 2015. And it shows the temperature departures from the 1971 to 2000 average in Colorado over the years 1900 to 2010. And the dashed line you see um, shows the 50 year trend, which was statistically significant. There's also a 100 year increasing trend that was statistically significant, but it's not displayed here. Um, and here we see a similar graph showing the percentage of the precipitation average. However, there was no significant trend in precipitation patterns changing over time in this case. So in this environment on the slopes of Pikes Peak at an elevation of around 1,600 meters was a botanical research station, the Carnegie's Institution's Alpine Laboratory. Frederick E. Clements, which is pictured here in his younger years, was a pioneering plant ecologist and served as director of the station. And in like the bottom right picture, he is pictured with his wife, Edith, who was also a renowned bot botanist. And by the way, the first woman to get her PhD from the University of Nebraska, and who also served as an instructor in the laboratory. So from the year 1900 to around 1940, Frederick and Edith spent their summers at the Alpine Laboratory. And during those four decades, they conducted a lot of influential work. They mentored many young ecologists. And by the looks of it, they also had some fun up there. As we see here in one of the pictures, they're riding down the cog railway that leads up to Pikes Peak. So during this time at the Alpine Laboratory, Frederick, Frederick Clemens and one of his mentees, Francis L. Long, conducted extensive observations of plants, pollinators, and the way they interact, which they then published in 1923 in the book Experimental Pollination, an outline of the ecology of flowers and insects. In this book, they present data that was collected over multiple years, starting in 1910. And they also um, present information on plant species they observed and the pollinators interacting with the plant species, the dates the observations were made, which then allows us to make inference on the phenology of plants and insects and sometimes also information on the frequency of visits of pollinators or the duration of observation. And members of our lab have invested a lot of time and effort into digitizing all this information into a nice handy data set. And then they have undergone an even greater effort to resurvey plant pollinator interactions at Pikes Peak in the years 2019 to 2022. So amongst other data, they collected um, the same information as Clements and Long, so namely plant species and the pollinators actively interacting with them, the date of the observation, frequency of visits, and the duration of observations. And then for this specific um, study here, we only selected observations 
on species that were present in both time periods, the past and the present, and from species that were observed for at least three days per time period, and species where at least three individuals were observed in each time period. And from the present data, we only included observations that were made within a 300 meter buffer around the Alpine Laboratory, so ranging from 1,300 to 1,900 meters, um, as to minimize confounding elevational shifts of species with temporal shifts. All in all, this left us with around 2,080 observations. 506 of them were made in the past, and 1,572 in the present. And the observations included 10 unique plant species, 25 unique pollinator species, engaging in around 150 unique interactions. So using this data set, we investigated the questions I presented you earlier. First, how did the phenology of plant and pollinator species change across time periods? To investigate this, we calculated the density curves of each species in the past and the present. And from these curves, we estimated the mean flowering day for plants and the mean flying day for pollinators. So this is how that looks like. Um, first, let's look at some of our plant species. So in the first panel of the figure, you see a ridge plot showing the distribution of observations over the Julian day, so the day of the year. In the past, pictured in gray, and in the present, pictured in green. The black lines um, represent the mean flowering day. And admittedly, this is maybe a bit of simplistic measure, um, but we're also working on exploring other measures such as length of the flowering or flying period or the area of overlap between the past and present density curves. But these results are not quite ready yet. So then in the second panel, um, you see the mean flowering day for each time period with the 95% confidence intervals even though they're pretty hard to see in this figure. Um, yeah, and then I performed a t-test for each species to investigate if there was a significant shift in the mean flowering day. The results of these we see here. Uh, so on the x-axis, there's the change in mean flowering day of each species. And um, to the left of the dashed line, species are flowering earlier in the present than in the past. And to the right of the dashed line are species that flower later in the present than they did in the past. Red dots indicate a statistically significant shift and black dots represent no statistical significance. So we see that out of our 10 plant species, six have a mean flowering day that is significantly earlier in the present, particularly Aquilegia corolea and Penstemon secundiflorus. The plant species that showed the greatest effect of flowering later in the present compared to the past was Geranium caspitosum. And just as a side note, these uh, images of the plants, they were drawn by Clemens's wife, Edith, she was also a very talented botanical illustrator. Um, so yeah, three species have a mean flowering day that is significantly later in the present, and one species showed no significant shift. Now, if we look at the pollinator species, we have the same figure as before, but here um, gray also indicates the past, but the present is indicated by yellow. And we also see some shifts in mean flying day. 16 out of the 25 species showed a significantly earlier mean flying day in the present. And only two species showed a later mean flying day. And seven of the species showed no significant shift. Two of the species that showed the greatest shift towards flying earlier um, were the bumblebee, Bombus melanopygus and the mining bee Andrena Krategi, 
And the species that shifted towards a later mean flying date were the hoverfly Aristalis dipator and the bumblebee Bombus occidentalis. And um, Bombus occidentalis is a very nice species to have in the data set as it was once one of the most common bee species in Northwest America. But recently there have been there has been a drastic decline in populations. So there is a big conservation potential for this species. Um, to further estimate the shifts in mean flowering and flying days, I also fitted linear mixed effect models with Julian day as response variable and the time period as predictor variable and plant or pollinator species respectively were included as random factor to allow for variation in the intercepts and slopes of the different species. So for plants, the model predicted that a mean flowering day is 1.03 days earlier in the, <laughs> in the present compared to the past, which is marginally significant. And the mean flying day of pollinators um, was almost five days earlier in the present. This effect was highly significant. So we have evidence for phenological shifts in both plants and pollinators, where pollinators showed a larger effect than plants. So these results lead us to our second question. Does change in temporal overlap of interacting species predict the persistence of their interactions? To investigate this question, we fitted a binomial reg regression model where interaction persistence is the dependent variable. So this is binary where one stands for persistence and zero for loss of the interaction. And the change in temporal overlap was included as predictor variable. So here's a visualization of our results. And we see that indeed species who have showed a higher negative change in days of overlap, so who over time decreased in the number of days overlapping. So that's to the left of the dashed line. Um, the persistence of interaction was significantly less likely, whereas the probability of interaction persistence was higher with a positive change in days of overlap. And this effect was statistically significant. Um, to go a bit more into detail here, um, so these are the interacting partners that showed a particular decrease in overlap. Two of them involve Bombus occidentalis. That's the bumblebee that showed a significantly later mean flying day and that saw drastic population declines in recent years. And two of the interactions uh, involved Andrena crategi, one of the species that saw um, the largest shifts towards an earlier mean flying day. And quite interesting, I find this interaction here, Bombus occidentalis and Geranium caspitosum. So in this example, both the pollinator and the plant have shifted to a later mean flowering or flying day but not to the same extent, um, resulting in a big reduction of overlap. And so the interaction between those two species is predicted to have a very low probability of persisting over time. So this might be a very nice example of phenological mismatch. Um, yeah, that's it for preliminary results for now. So just to recap, uh, we saw phenological shifts in both plants and pollinators, whereas the effect was greater in pollinators than in plants. We also found evidence that change in temporal overlap of the interacting species has implications for the persistence of their interactions. And finally, I want to emphasize that historical data are valuable data sources and can be used not only, but also for documenting phenological shifts over long time periods. And historical data has great potential to investigate changes in species, community composition, and ecosystem functions over time.
So yeah, with this, I want to thank you all for being here and listening to me, for all the great people at the Risasco Lab, putting a lot of work into this project, all the funders that made this work possible. And um, yeah, I'm happy to take some questions now or also feel free to reach out via email later or connect on ResearchGate or LinkedIn. Thank you. Thank you, what cool data. Um, great, um, so Afil. Yeah, thank you, it's very interesting. Um, I was wondering whether with your data you can um, assess uh, which are the losers or the winners of this um, shift in phenology because I imagine that some species because of this mismatch might have also gained interactions or increase the diversity of pollinators or increase the diversity of plants that pollinate. Um, so can you, did you look at that? Yes, uh, absolutely good question. So I have not looked at that yet. Um, I mean, we've, we've seen some potential species that might be the biggest losers here because they lose a lot of their interactions. Um, but I haven't really looked too much into the, the specific species yet, but that's definitely something I'm, I'm planning to do, yeah. Thank you. Great. Malin? Yeah, really cool talk, Liana. Um, Thanks. I had maybe, maybe a related question, but are there, is there any potential to look at changes in like what the what the change in interactions might mean for the pollinators or the plants or the sort of measures of performance you might be able to pull out, um, maybe seed set. I don't study plants or pollinators, but Ooh, so there's set. a way to look at uh, yeah the consequences. Yeah, it would be it would be so cool to have um, data on like plant fitness or plant reproduction, but unfortunately we don't. Um, I mean we could maybe with a lot of effort try to find herbarium specimens and sort of try to assess um, plant reproduction that way. But yeah, that we, we so far we don't have any real data on like plant fitness or pollinator fitness, unfortunately. Um, we work with this data set for another project to more look at the interaction networks and how they changed over time. So this can give us more of an insight how the stability of ecosystem has changed over time. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, we don't have like trait measures or measures on, on species fitness. Great, Jeff? Yes, hi, that was, that was cool. Um, so the, your, the four big losers were only two species of bees, right? So obviously they shifted a lot, but I also noticed that, um, from the plants, three of them were, were rubus. Um, yes. so I guess rubus is, is changing their phenology a lot too. Um, Actually, not that much compared to other species. Uh, rubus, the rubus species didn't show that much of a, a shift in their phenology. But so it might be that just their pollinators undergo quite a big shift, but the plants themselves, yeah, surprisingly did not show such a big response. Hmm. Um, but also, yeah, quite, quite interesting in terms of the, those winners and losers. Um, so what I showed you is certain interactions that are maybe lost um, with certain species. But on the other hand, the same species can also rewire and engage in new interactions that they maybe couldn't in the past. So that's something I've I've seen some evidence for, but I haven't had time to look into that deeply. So that may be the the bumblebee that decreased quite a lot in its population. Um, so it might be that it now engages in interactions with more 
we, we plant species that flower later. So these these pollinator plant pollinator interaction systems have the ability to be quite resilient and rewire um, and so form new interactions over time. So that's why I'm a bit hesitant to maybe talk about winners and losers because it can be that one of their interaction is lost, but then they form a new interaction, which might benefit both the plant and the pollinator too. So this this requires still quite a lot more work to to figure out. Yeah, but, but it does seem like you have the data because maybe uh, in your data is that maybe those rubus species have picked up new pollinators and that, that should be in there. And so maybe you could pick winners and losers if you look at net gains and losses or some, something like that. Yeah, just in terms of seeing if they engage in more interactions now and than in the past, that's something I've been looking into. Um, but... Yeah, we're we're also a bit maybe limited by our historic data because as I showed you, we have way more observations in the present than in the past. So it might be, especially for the winners, that if we see something picks up more interactions now, that could maybe just be that our historic data set is just not as extensive than our present data set. On the other hand, for the interaction losses, since we sampled more in the present, we can be fairly sure that if an interaction would persist, we would have picked it up in the present. So yeah, in terms of, I think, losers or losses of interaction, we can be more confident than in terms of um, yeah, gains of interactions. All right, cool, thanks. Thank you. Maybe I'll squeeze in uh, one last question. So I was curious, um, it's great that you have like a few years of recent data and I think um, a few years in the past as well. And I was curious if you looked at interannual variation and if some organisms are just more responsive than others. Um, yeah, great question. So unfortunately, in our past data set, we know that it's been collected over multiple years, but for most of the records, we don't actually know which year it was collected from. So um, yeah, we're, we're limited by our past data in that, that we just don't know which records was collected in which year. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Great. Okay, yeah, and a suggestion about um, resampling your current data. Great. All right. Um, so, yeah, I think probably actually could squeeze in uh, one more question if anyone has it, but um, we can start transitioning over to Mayland as well. All right, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Great. All right. Uh, just before we come up on time, uh, say, yeah, it's uh, fun to continue with another data set that is uh, quite old, but um, now looking at the genomic perspective. Um, so Malin Pinsky and a big crew uh, will be presenting on of rum and fishes, temporal genomics reveal evolutionary responses to a century of environmental change in the Philippines. Feel free to wait a minute if you want. Almost at time. <laughs> Sounds good. I can wait. Wait a tiny bit. Yes, we're at time, so I can jump in. We'll leave us plenty of time for discussion at the end. Um, great. Uh, actually, audio, I think, would be a bit better if I do this. Does this work out, Lauren? Great, thanks very much for that introduction. And uh, I guess a special thanks, Lauren, for the invitation to be here today. It's been really inspiring to hear the projects that are presented already and really excited to talk about overlap across different methods and complementarity in our discussion that happens 
happened after this. As Lauren said, I'm Malin Pinsky. I'm an associate professor at the University of California, Santa Cruz, lead the Global Change Research Group. And I'm talking today about what we're calling the Albatross Recollection Project. And this project is all about the insights we can gain from some old fish that have been sitting in effectively rum for a long time. And stay tuned to learn why that's interesting. As you can see from the long list of uh, co-authors and institutions on this talk, a lot of scientific expertise and cooperation has gone into the project I'll, I'll talk about today, crossing oceans and continents, everything, everyone from early career to retired researchers. And I'm really grateful for the group that came together to make this possible. I particularly want to mention Kent Carpenter at Old Dominion University, who brought all of us together initially. So the, the context for this research is that we, we know the world is filled with an incredible diversity of species from microbes to plants, from insects to squid, and yet the environment in which they live is changing rapidly, as we've been hearing a lot about in today's session. A major challenge for all of us is to uncover the general rules that govern how species and communities respond to this change. And the big question is whether, where, and when the coping mechanisms that have helped species survive historically are going to be sufficient in this modern time of, of rapid change. So in response to environmental change, species have a range of mechanisms for coping. Um, those include moving to new locations at various spatial scales or persisting in place through physiological tolerance or plasticity or adaptive evolution. And a lot of the research so far has been either on present day physiology where we can measure Physio physiological tolerances uh, experimentally, or uh, looking at shifting species distribution. Uh, as Lauren explained earlier today, a lot of the resurveys that have been done so far focus on this geographic perspective and geographic distributions, changes in occupancy and, ab and abundance. On the other hand, the symposium has been a really fascinating view into the broader and deeper set of resurveys that are now possible to get at the functional changes through time. In particular, though, our understanding of evolutionary responses remains much more limited. And the traditional explanation would have been that evolution is rare in response to global change because it's too slow to matter for many species. On the other hand, our tools for studying evolution have also been pretty limited. So another potential explanation is that we just haven't been able to look effectively for evolution so far. There are a few key evolutionary responses to think about. One is genetic drift. It's just a random change in allele frequencies from one generation to the next. And if populations decline, drift becomes stronger and populations lose genetic diversity, which in turn can reduce adaptive capacity. And if extreme, can actually reduce individual fitness as well through inbreeding. Selection, on the other hand, can enable adaptive evolution, such that phenotypes in a population or a species change rapidly and fitness stays high despite environmental change. Gene flow is also a key process, moving genetic variation among populations, and that can be adaptive or maladaptive or simply neutral. And these processes also interact with each other in important ways as well. One key idea is this concept of evolutionary rescue is laid out nicely as theory by Gamolkowitz and Holt a quarter century ago, and also explained at the end of the last session by, by Seema as well. In this plot, the environment has changed and absolute fitness is below one and the population is, has, is declining to extinction. But on the other hand, the population might decline initially, but over time evolve to have higher fitness and then recover. And that's the process of evolutionary rescue. So we, as we start to dig into questions of recent evolution, the tools of temporal genomics provide a powerful window into understanding what has happened. Temporal genomics is just the application of repeated DNA sequencing from a population through time so that we can directly observe change in the genetic variation within populations. Many studies like this are what are called evolve and resequence studies within labs, especially done with microbes, but applying these approaches outside the lab in wild populations, I think is especially new and exciting. Historical samples often come from museums, other natural history archives, or they can come from an intentionally longitudinal studies that are set up ahead of time. Renee Clark, a recent PhD student in our group, led a review of the 
temporal genomics literature, and it revealed 281 studies published in the last couple of decades that studied genetic or genomic change in wild animals sampled through time since 1800. So we're not talking about ancient DNA much deeper in time. Um, we had a very cool talk earlier in the session about uh, ancient environmental DNA, but this is focused on the changes over the last couple hundred years. So a lot of the more recent studies have looked at changes in either genetic diversity or genetic connectivity, reflecting the uh, largely neutral genetic markers that have been accessible for a lot of the research so far. This plot shows the number of studies just as bars. And you can see that studies on evolutionary adaptation here on the right were the least common. On the other hand, as genomic data from historical and contemporary samples becomes increasingly accessible, studies in, on adaptation also become much more feasible. It's a little faint in this plot, but the dotted blue line shows the increasing use of single nucleotide polymorphism data in temporal genomic studies. And those, those kinds of data are often much more suitable for questions of selection because they cover a much wider fraction, a much larger fraction of the, of the genome. Part of our goal in publishing this, this review was just to more formally name and define the field and therefore hopefully help attract more focus and effort to these kinds of approaches. Part of what makes a temporal approach powerful is that evolution at its core is a change in allele frequency. And the temporal dynamics of alleles can allow us to distinguish the processes that are driving change. So this figure shows allele frequencies on the y-axis with time and generations on the x-axis. Uh, alleles governed by neutral genetic drift are shown in gray, and their trajectories are dramatically different from a beneficial allele shown in blue, which jumps to high frequency once it appears, or from deleterious alleles in red that disappear soon after they appear. These temporal methods are especially useful because our typical population genomic methods actually don't work well for the kinds of evolutionary processes that we expect to be driven by global change. For example, when strong selection causes a brand new mutation in the genome to increase in frequency to fixation, that's a process called a hard selective sweep. And it leaves a characteristic signature in the genome with low diversity near the site of that selective sweep as shown in, in this plot. On the other hand, we also have what's called a soft sweep. So that's when the allele already exists in the population and then becomes favored because of environmental change, so a change in the environment. For most long-lived species facing global change, that's probably the more likely case because generation times are long and novel mutations are relatively rare. The problem is that soft sweeps leave little to no signal in the genome, as again shown in this pl plot from Molly Przeworski. In this case, it's the allele trajectories through time and temporal genomics more broadly that are so useful. I also want to make a distinction between complete sweeps in which the beneficial allele has gone to fixation and incomplete sweeps in which the allele is only partway there. Again, these latter cases are even harder to detect unless we have temporal data. And it's these, again, these incomplete sweeps that are probably more likely when we're still observing evolution in action during ongoing environmental change. So we have plenty of examples now for rapid evolution in response to pollution, to disease, climate, and many other environmental changes. We've heard some cool examples already in this talk. And it does show that adaptive variation does often exist for selection to act upon. But on the other hand, other hand you know, these examples have often been published because they show evolution, leaving often unanswered the question for how common and widespread these evolutionary changes are across species and in which species or context they're most likely to occur. So I think one of the interesting questions before us now is to understand which species and in which, which circumstances species are most likely to evolve and in which cases we instead shouldn't expect that to be an important response to environmental change. So starting to answer this question has taken, taken us to two very different but historically linked places. So the, the first is the Philippines where I've worked for the last 15 years. It's a place of incredible beauty and diversity, both on land and in the ocean. It's also a place of intense human impacts on the ocean with more than 100 million people living on 7,500 islands. It's often called a hotspot, both for biodiversity and for adversity. It's also in the tropics, which when it comes to global change is often a blank spot in much of our understanding. 
The second place is the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History, which has one of the largest collections of fishes in the world. Many of these fishes are from uh, the research vessel Albatross expedition to the Philippines in 1908 and 1909, which made one of the largest and most uh, diverse ichthyological collections in the world with more than 79,000 specimens. So this is a photo of the albatross in the upper right of your screen. And it was a quite a colonialist expedition uh, launched by the US. It was just after the United States had purchased the Philippines from the Spain after from Spain after the Spanish American War. And one of the goals of our project is to try to write a new chapter in the narrative around this expedition by building stronger scientific and educational partnerships uh, with Filipino colleagues. So the expedition stored the fish in uh, high proof alcohol that was available locally made from local sugarcane. So think fish stored in rum for the last 110 years. And that's actually really unusual for museum collections of fishes. Uh, most fishes are stored in formalin, which rapidly breaks up and degrades DNA. But in contrast, ethanol preserves DNA quite well. Many collections like this would have been transferred into formalin upon storage in the museum, but actually we can't find any evidence this was ever done for the albatross collection. It seems like it was just too many jars for that to be feasible. So because of a fluke in many ways of scientific history, we have an incredible archive of genomes from more than a century ago. Since the time of these historical collections, the human population in the Philippines has grown 10 times and the ocean has experienced nearly a degree Celsius of warming, mirroring similar changes across much of the globe. But there's also substantial spatial heterogeneity across the Philippines. Some places in the Philippines remain remote and relatively pristine, including Palawan on the Western edge, and others remain relatively cool due to ocean currents, including the Sulu archipelago in the, in the South. So to understand evolution over this last century, we've now redone many of the albatross collections and what we're, as I mentioned, are calling the albatross recollection project. So we can understand the evolutionary changes that have occurred over the last century. So that's albatross as in the boats, not albatross the bird, though I get plenty of questions about this in case there is any remaining confusion. So we're now working closely with a really amazing set of Filipino collaborators, um, including in the beginning, Aniel Alcala, who was really important for setting up this collaboration, though he has now passed away, unfortunately. Rene Abisamis and Muji Santos have also been and continue to be really important collaborators on this project as well. Uh, Rene is at University of Philippines and Muji Santos is at the Bureau of Fisheries and Aquatic Resources. This map on the right shows the 66 sites that we've resampled over the past few years which span much of the Philippines, including regions in the Southwest that are effectively closed to Americans for security reasons. The collections cover 35 species of fishes across 13 orders, including atherinids, palmacentrids, cygnathids, clupeids, and apigonids, really wide range of, range of species. The species also span a range of life histories which provide an uh, exciting opportunity to understand the relationship between traits and evolutionary responses. From species like Spratiloides delicatulus with a generation time of only a couple months to Solarius fasciatus with a generation time 25 times longer. To also species like Geris oyena that is relatively large but short-lived. And we hypothesize stronger genetic drift in species with shorter generation time and larger body size since larger body size is associated with lower abundance in, in fishes. And what's so unique here is that it's a comprehensive look of, at genetic change across an assemblage of species all from the, the same place. So getting data out of this archive has not been straightforward, despite the fact that they're stored in uh, ethanol. And our sequencing appro approach has evolved over time as, as well, no pun intended. Uh, we're using high coverage Illumina sequencing to build the very rough draft genome assemblies um, with 28 species completed or near finished so far. We initially started out with RADSeq for resequencing, but we quickly moved to a bead-based capture approach that would target 6,000 randomly selected regions across each species genome. That approach is nice because it has relatively high depth of coverage, provides hard genotypes um, 
So we've done that for, um, or have in progress processed genotypes for 12 species. And because you know, we've been targeting in particular uh, historical collections that had large number of individuals, we have up to hundred fish from each time period in each location, allows us to look at relatively fine uh, changes in allele frequencies through time. On the other hand, uh, that capture bead-based approach uh, had relatively um, inconsistent success across species. It uh, looks like probably based on contaminants that are in the, in the sugar cane alcohol. So we've now moved on to low coverage whole genome sequencing. That's partly because uh, the cost of sequencing has come down so much. That's pro proven a lot more reliable than capture baits for these historical samples. This latter approach, because it's low coverage, it provides allele frequencies within populations and within individuals, it's only probabilistic genotypes. So we have genotyping completed or in progress for another 19 species with that approach. One of our first questions was simply whether we were actually sequencing historical DNA, it's, which is characterized by certain damage patterns, including uh, cytosine deamination. And that appears as excess cytosine to thymine misincorporations at the five prime end of sequences, which you can see here. And in a complementary ex excess of guanine to adenine misincorporations at the, at the three prime, prime end. And the results here for a, a leonathid or a ponyfish population that was collected from the northern Philippines. And you can see in the plots that the degree of excess is detectable, but not especially large compared to DNA samples from other studies that weren't preserved as well, where misincorporation rates can be as high as 25% at the read ends. We're looking just at a few percent here. The key point, however, though, is that, yes, it does look like we're sequencing historical DNA in the historical samples. So from these allele frequencies, we can construct a what's called a joint site frequency spectrum shown here with color that indicates the number of single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs at each pair of historical and contemporary allele frequencies. So the historical frequencies increase along the, the y-axis and the contemporary frequencies increase along the x-axis. So you can see there are blue colors, for example, at the lower left, shows that there are a lot of loci that are at low frequencies in both time periods, which is what we'd expect. And then the off diagonal points show alleles that changed frequency substantially. This example is for uh, a pony fish called Gaza minuta, lives in mangroves and um, in silty nearshore habitats and it's often caught for food in the Philippines. And from that joint site frequency spectrum, we can reconstruct the population history using a maximum likelihood method called MAMI2. Uh, this graph shows that history from the distant past on the right to the present on the left. And the site frequency spectrum suggests a strong population crash, actually four orders of magnitude in the last century, as the Philippines was developing rapidly and fishing was becoming much more intense. That's not true for all species, however. The reconstructed history for this atherinid silver side suggests, in contrast, a recent increase in population size. So reconstructing some pretty dramatic changes in the fish community near shore. We can also compare cross species. So just for example, Atherina morris and Dractensis, this is a silver side found in very shallow waters near shore in small schools. It isn't commonly fished. In contrast, Gaza minuta and Equilites laterofenestra are both leonathid pony fishes and they're both much more heavily fished. And all of these are marine fishes that presumably have quite large population sizes. On the other hand, we hypothesize that maybe diversity, if it's lost, would be lost to a greater extent in the more heavily fished species. So this is an analysis that's being led by Renee Clark, uh, as I mentioned, a former PhD student in our group. And I mentioned her earlier in the context of the temporal genomics review. So in this case, all of these fishes were collected from Hamilo Cove in Northern Philippines, not far from Manila, the capital of the Philippines, collected in 1908 and again, again in 2018. The samples were sequenced to 40x depth for the historical samples and 100x depth for the modern samples. This was using a bead-based capture approach that we were using earlier on. So genome-wide nucleotide diversity differed about four times across these three species, at least in the early 1900s. So that's shown with these squares here. On the other hand, when we plot the modern samples with circles, we found significantly lower diversity in one of the pony fishes on the far right, 
a non-significantly lower diversity in the other pony fish in the middle, and a surprising actually increase in diversity for the atherin and silver side on the left. It might result from gene flow because this is probably a species that's highly genetically structured um, from these small, very small near shore populations, but it might also come from the population growth that I showed earlier. We do see though that the two commercially fish species have the most evidence for diversity loss and also consistent with the population declines we detected from joint site frequency spectra. For more details though, uh, check out Renee's talk in Montreal at the in-person evolution meeting in late July. Uh, it's gonna be a really good talk. The other part of what's exciting about this project is that because we have so many species in the same region, we can start to look at coordinated changes across those species. So we're also developing the methods for comparing across species. So we can understand the dynamics of an entire guild and whether species experience synchronous population declines shown there on the left, or instead maybe just unrelated changes in population size. There's also a third possibility I'm not showing here. Maybe the population size changes are explained by species characteristics, like whether they're fished or not, or whether, uh, or by a species trait like, like uh, body size. So with, in collaboration with Isaac o Overcast from the California Academy of Sciences, we're building from uh, the phylogeographic temporal analysis method or PTA that he's developed. And it, from the joint site frequency spectra, we then construct multi-species joint site frequency spectra. So these are cubes of allele frequencies across time and species. From that, we train a machine learning model on simulated demographic histories and then use that machine learning model to infer the community-wide demographic histories. And Brendan Reed, a research scientist in the Global Change Research Group is leading a lot of that work. So far, we've been able to show that uh, the inference is, uh, is relatively uh, good precision. And now we're trying to put together the empirical data to test it on that. As we move to whole genome resequencing, the technology also opens up a whole new set of questions because as I explained earlier, alleles experiencing strong positive selection will increase dramatically in frequency. And that signature allows us to identify alleles under selection. And more broadly to understand the extent of adaptive evolution over the past century in the Philippines. On the other hand, I don't have any results to show you yet, but stay tuned, uh, those will be coming. Once those genes are identified, it also opens up a new approach to functional resurveys by tracing the temporal dynamics of those alleles that underlie phenotypes. So that requires either phenotype data, so that's something we're starting to collect with skeletal shapes that we can get out of both the museum and the modern samples, and also growth rates reconstructed from fish ear bones that are called otoliths, or prior knowledge from a species that's well understood. Either way though, there's the potential to reconstruct past physiological function or phenotypes from the genomic traces that are stored in natural history archives. Uh, we're still a ways away from that with the albatross recollection, but I think it's a really exciting prospect. When we also have samples spread across both space and time for the same species, as we do for the albatross recollection, we, all, we can also test the evolutionary mechanisms that have maintained genetic diversity historically. For example, it might be that alleles that are positively selected through time in a warming ocean were also the same alleles that were maintained in warmer ocean waters by spatially divergent selection. So that's the kind of test that's made possible by historical collections like these, which again, I think is a really exciting opportunity. The last thing I wanted to mention is that there's also a strong capacity building component to the, this project, including bioinformatics bioinforma training for Filipino and American students and faculty. We also have Filipino students working directly on the uh, albatross recollection research projects. And there's also a research experience for undergrads who participated in cultural exchanges to the Philippines and who've done research on fish biology and genetic diversity. One in particular to mention Mariel Malabag, whose photo is in the upper right. She's done some really cool research on how levels of genetic diversity across fishes are related to species characteristics. And got a paper that's been submitted and now is in revision. So just to summarize, I've argued that evolution remains one of the more poorly understood responses to recent evolutionary change and that these temporal genomic methods provide 
really exciting new window into these otherwise invisible evolutionary dynamics. So the Albatross Recollection Project in particular is taking advantage of this unique archive of genomic diversity across marine fishes from a century ago with initial results showing substantial population declines and loss of genetic diversity in some species, but definitely not universally. And much more coming soon as we continue to understand how those patterns vary across species. And then going forward, these kinds of temporal genomic data sets I think have a really big potential to transform the way we understand evolutionary change, including by identifying genes under selection, annotating these genes with function, and also by expanding out to community scale analyses. So we can start to understand and predict the species for which and evolutionary change and rescue will be important and for which species it won't be. So with that, many people to thank, including an incredible group of collaborators, National Science Foundation for supporting this work over the years and the many members of the Global Change Research Group who make all of this fun. Thanks to all of you for listening. Great, thanks so much, Malin. Amazing data. Um, so people should feel free to put questions in the question and answer or raise your hand, speak up. Yeah, I'll get going with a question while people come up with them. Um, so at the end, when you're talking about the um, temporal and spatial sampling, that uh, seems like an amazing resource and the, the vision for parsing it out sounds great. And I was curious um, whether you thought about trying to take advantage of that through um, in some of the analyses that you talked about already in terms of like potentially trying to validate some of your models of um, population demography and such. You mean by comparing across sites that have more or less uh, fishing or more or less human impact? Yeah, or just even trying to like take out some of the data initially to use for a test for some of the models. Yeah, I'm trying to think, maybe I'm not quite following what you're getting at. Um, you know, the, the models are reconstructed from joint site frequency spectra. So um, they're, at least the ones that are reconstructing demographic dynamics are especially suited for um, single sites. Gene mm -hmm. flow, though, is something to think about, um, which we haven't fully incorporated into into some of these into some of these tests. You know, it's about um, comparing different potential historical uh, demographies against that joint site frequency spectra. So. It's about, you know, one hypothesis that is just constant through time, or there's only been one population size change, or there, there have been a couple, um, you know, whether there's been a change in deep time versus just a change in recent time as well. Um, many of these species do show long-term, sort of deeper time signatures of population increase into the LGM and then a long-term decline since then. So that's an, also an important part that for interpreting these joint site frequency spectra in addition to trying to detect any recent recent changes. Um, we do, you know, I did mention that there's environmental heterogeneity. So, you know, to the, maybe what you're getting as, you know, as we're building hypotheses for like, do we, for which species do we expect uh, to see loss of genetic diversity or strong declines or strong selection? We can then test that against sites that haven't had as much environmental change. And we'd expect to see less loss of diversity, less selection in sites with less environmental change. And um, Kira Fitz, one of, one of the other PhD students uh, in our group right now is starting to look at that for one species where we've got collections from near Manila and also in far Western Philippines and Palawan that has, has had much less human impact, less fishing, um, just partway through that collection, but really initial <laughs> results suggest that there's been more genetic diversity loss closer to Manila. Um, we haven't yet gotten to the selection question, but that should be coming soon. Great, very cool. Um, and Brian put a question in the question and answer of uh, Sulu Archipelago is relatively remote. I'm curious if you have any fish samples from there and what changes have occurred such as genetic diversity. Yeah, Sulu Archipelago is pretty re remote, um, especially you know for security reasons, uh, Folks from North America um, are strongly discouraged from going there. There are still some uh, 
larger population centers. So there, even within there, there's a bit of heterogeneity. It's also a really interesting region because it's much colder uh, in terms of ocean temperatures than other parts of the Philippines. So there's persistent upwelling along the Sulu Archipelago Ridge. Um, so that's part of the spatial comparison that we're using um, to look at uh, change selection that may be related to ocean temperature changes. I don't have any results yet to show from the Sulu Archipelago, um, but we're getting there. <laughs> we have a lot. We have a lot of species in the bioinformatics pipeline right now. Stratoloides delicatulus, uh, the blue sprat that I mentioned in particular, is going to be a really interesting species. That's one of the species that we have uh, quite good spatial sampling, including two sites in the Sulu Archipelago, um, also a site uh, closer to Manila and in Palawan as well. Great, fabulous. Maybe we'll uh, address one more question before we shift into um, a panel discussion that hopefully people will stick around for. Um, as you can see in the chat, Catherine is uh, wondering um, about connecting analyses that use contemporary data to reconstruct historical demography to the results directly from your historical samples. Can you get convergence in your estimates or ground truth the historic estimates with your historical samples? Yeah, with the demography, it's pretty straightforward. Um, I didn't, I guess I didn't show it today, but uh, we have, you know, we can use, we can set the test up in three different ways. We can reconstruct historical demography just from the contemporary samples, from both the contemporary and the historical samples, which provides more power, or from just the historical samples. And they, in the examples we've, the species we've tested so far, the results are quite consistent, you know, from either the contemporary or uh, both contemporary and historical samples, we see this recent population decline. If we only look at the historical samples, we don't see that. We still see the deeper time dynamics, but we don't see the, the recent decline in most cases. But that's a, that's a great question. And it's one of the nice things about having both sets of samples. Obviously, I wish we had even more, you know, intermediate samples through time, but it's still, uh, I'm very happy to be able to have these two time points. Great, that sounds good. Yeah, um, so we should have plenty of time for specific question for, questions for the various uh, panelists, but we want to uh, start out with some overall questions while um, some of you think of your own questions to try. We've seen a lot of uh, really amazing data sets, a lot of really interesting approaches. So we want to think a little bit about different strengths of these different approaches, how we might combine them and really this opportunity to try to catalyze this field of functional resurveys. Um, so uh, I think, I'll, I guess I'll call on people, maybe we'll start in the order we went through today, um, but what have you found surprising or challenging about your research examining function through time? And again, uh, please feel free to start the questions uh, after this, we'll get to it quickly. You could raise your hand or we can also start getting questions in the question and answer, that would be great. Um, so we started out with Lucas today. Um, I don't know if you want to start out with our answers. Hopefully we have uh, Lucas, but let's, uh, I see Seema there. So let's go uh, to Seema. Um, yeah, I think one of the challenges is trying to explain the lack of change in phenotypes when you don't find change. and. Um, yeah, trying to, yeah, is it just that it's not enough time? It, is it is it a real result or not? So to me, that's that's one of the big ones. Great, Liana? Yeah, I think in terms of challenges with our particular data set, we, we rely so much on the past observations and just uh, the documentation of how they collected their data to be complete and accurate. Um, but yeah, there's just a lot of things we don't know how the past data set was assembled or observed or collected. Um, so yeah, that, that will probably introduce quite some biases into the work we do, but for now it's still one of the, the best options we have to get these long-term perspectives. Great, Malin? Yeah, there've been a lot of surprises and challenges as we <laughs> dive into genomics for uh, 
a diverse group of species in uh, a relatively understudied part of the world. I mean, we discovered that one of the species we're studying is probably octoploid. That's been really complicated. Um, a lot of cryptic species as well um, that you know were collected thinking you know, it, historically thinking they were one species. In some cases, they've now been described as two and we're trying to sort that all out genetically. In other cases, um, you know, it's just a poorly described group of fishes and the uh, taxonomy isn't very well known and we're trying to sort it out on the fly um, as we go through the genomics. So there've been a lot of surprises there, challenges as well. Um, so both sides of the coin. And I think like Liana mentioned, you know, both, you know, the initial surprise and, you know, incredible opportunity from having these amazing data sets, but then they're also really limited. Um, you know, we would, for example, love to be able to look at odalis from these historical samples to understand uh, how fast these fish were growing, but at least the few, uh, few samples we've looked at so far, it looks like the odalis dissolved because the, the solution over the last uh, century was relatively acidic. That just wasn't preserved well. Yeah. Genotypes are hard. We've got genotypes, but not phenotypes in all cases. Yeah, so interesting. And all the historical contingencies of how things were preserved. Um, great. So I'll just say, uh, from my perspective, uh, we've been quite surprised about the role of environmental variation, and particularly uh, interannual variation and how it interfaces with elevation as well. Um, so for example, when we thought high, up, way high on the mountain, where we see a lot of variation, uh, within a year was going to be sort of where we saw a lot of action and role of plasticity and such. Um, but we didn't really anticipate the temporal dimension that you know, if these insects can have a lot longer season at lower elevation, then that's a super important driver of plasticity. We didn't necessarily anticipate. And also things like the extent to which our models are, are projecting and we're empirically seeing like shifts in the direction of selection within uh, like at short time scales interannual that's slowing down evolution, but also that we're projecting that reversals in the direction of selection over long time periods as climate change proceeds as well. So um, yeah, accumulating these different studies where you can really look at responses to variation across elevations and time scales seems like it's gonna be really interesting. Okay, I think we'll do uh, one more question before we see um, what questions the rest of you have, um, but, what functional resurvey approaches or combination of approaches do you think are particularly promising for better anticipating responses to environmental change? So hopefully reflecting on some of the different approaches that we've seen today and uh, their strengths and complementarity. Um, maybe we'll go backwards, start with Malin. Sure. Um, you know, I think the the combination, uh, there's been, you know, a bunch of us have talked to one extent or another about uh, evolutionary changes. And obviously I'm really excited about trying to understand the importance of that, that process. But I think what's really exciting is when we can, we have both some measure of physiological function or some strong phenotype through time, and then can also start to understand the genetic and genomic basis for that. Um, those are really exciting opportunities um, sort of to put those two together and tease out to what extent are the phenotypic changes plastic, to what extent are they evolutionary as well? So I'm jealous in many ways, Lauren, of the system that you're working in. <laughs> Great, all right, Liana? I had to find my mouse there. Um, yeah, I think I I agree with Malin, like just a combination of approaches is super valuable um so like we discussed that in one of the questions in my talk it will be super cool to have let's say herbarium specimens where we can dig into plant fitness and um yeah just combining different aspects of the the system to get a deeper understanding um i also think there's these days there's a lot of potential in digging more into those non-traditional data sources we have. Like with the with new large language models, we could sift through a lot of 
like museum records or correspondences or so on just to to get data that would have been way too much effort to get a couple of years ago so i think there's with the new technologies there's a lot of potential in getting very cool so far non-traditional data sources great and sima Yeah, I, I agree with uh, Malin and Liana. I mean, I think that combining approaches is really powerful. And I was really impressed, Lauren, by your ability to combine mechanistic modeling with experimental thermal performance curves and, you know, fitness data from the field. And so being able to, I think if we want to understand phenotypic function through time, be, knowing how those phenotypes are related to fitness and natural populations is important, but it's hard data to get. Um, so being able to have that connection um, on top of the genomics uh, or the, um, you know, physiological traits that we're measuring is, is super exciting, I think. Great. Yeah, and I'll just echo everybody as well that that combination of approaches, particularly bringing in things like genomic or physiological measures to really try to get at mechanism is really promising. Uh, also echoing Seema's point about looking at controlled environments as well as in with the natural variation, like uh, all Seema's heroic field work is really impressive. Um, and I guess I will say uh, also, you know, I'm really excited about the potential. We've, we've heard like these really uh, funky kind of amazing ways that people have found data, but Recently, um, colleagues and I have just been trying to go through uh, all the data that are in papers, and there's just endless opportunity to do resurveys um, with data in papers. Uh, particularly now, um, you know, it's been long; it's starting to be long enough that the data is readily available through archiving, which is exciting. And I'll say, you know, personally, we've contacted quite a few authors to say, like. Do you think you'd see evolutionary change since you did your dissertation 40 years ago or something? And you know, everybody has just been so willing and uh, excited to engage um, that you know, if there's people out there, particularly uh, junior people getting started, I, I really think it's a great opportunity to get going in a field, know what's been done and build on it. Um, and so I hope we'll see, there's just compared to these funky sources of data, there's just so much published data out there that I'm really excited about, about the promise of that. Great. Okay. Well, we'll see. Uh, hopefully some of you others out there have uh, questions. Otherwise, we'll keep going with some of these more prescribed ones. Great. Okay. Um, Afela? Yeah. So I had a question about uh, the future, actually, because uh, so uh, you all, uh, well, a lot of you talked about um, using data that were sometime collected uh, 100 years ago. And um, so are you also thinking about the way we collect data or store data or, uh, you know, record things so that it would make it easy for scientists of the future to use our data to do the same kind of things that you are doing now? So I wanted to know your opinion about that. Great question. Yeah, people should just speak up with answers. I'm happy to jump in at least initially, and then there's probably a bunch I'll miss and others can fill in. Um, yeah, very much so. Um, you know, at least at least in our group, we put a big emphasis on um, making data publicly available and archiving those those data sets in ways that uh, are understandable, not only by others in the future, but even by us in future years. Um, uh, you know, I've just in the last, you know, I, if you, few years, you know, realizing that, oh, right, some of those early, earlier dissertations in, in our group, you know, they, yes, they had GitHub repos, yes, the data are there, but they're maybe not as well documented as we thought they were, and just sort of this constant learning process of how much metadata and documentation is really important, um, having scripts involved, included as well, um, you know, having journals like uh, the American Naturalist that requires script and data archiving, I think also helps incentivize this more broadly across uh, across the community. So it's not just sort of individual research groups that, that want to do it. Um, and it's also changed my perspective on uh, genetic samples. You know, often they get collected for a project and then kind of discarded. 
Um, you know, maybe they're stored in a freezer somewhere, but they kind of get forgotten. So we're actually in the process of setting up um, much more formalized sample archiving, at least for our research group, so that we know what we have, we know when they were collected, we have all of that metadata in one place and the samples are well well stored in a, in a minus 80. Um, so that, yeah, in a decade or two or three, um, we or someone else could go back to those. Because um, I think that is really important in a way that I hadn't appreciated when I started my career. Anyone else ready to jump in? Seema looks like maybe. Well, I would just add that um, I agree with everything Malin said. I, I, those of us working with plants, you know, we're it's like very stressful keeping the seeds happy. And, um, you know, I don't have a proper seed. I My lab is in a building without central AC. Um, it's very humid in North Carolina, you know, so it's always a stress. I have this thing that emails me every time the temperature gets above some level and, you know, but I should be storing my seeds um, in, a, in a better way. And there's people at seed banks who've worked that out. Um, so that's a something that's on my mind that I haven't, you know, I have, it's, it's a lot of seeds. So um, yeah, haven't worked that out, frankly. Um, but yeah, one could still go back to the populations and recollect, but having the, that past seed source is really tricky, I think, without the right resources for storing. Just maybe to add something to Malin and Seema. Um, so a usually big consideration for me is also, um, can we store our resurvey data or modern data in a in the same place the historical data was stored from or was stored in? So if someone in 50, 60, how many years in the future wants to, you know, use that collective data from us from a century ago to um yeah, to do yet another resurvey. Um, it's nice to have all of that sort of stored in the same place. So, um, yeah, that just also highlights the, the importance of museums and um, digitizing museum collections and make make all these museum records read, readily available for, for people to look through. Yeah, great. Yeah, I really agree with the uh, value of museums and it's super exciting to me all the new ways people are thinking of using that historic data um i'll just add that uh in my group using this historic data we really struggle struggle with the value of keeping detailed historic notebooks compared to using some of these more modern um computer computer based strategies um I, we're probably much better at the open and reproducible computational science than we are at storing these details. Um, and so, you know, working with Joel Kingsolver, he, uh, you know, on a weekly basis is pulling out notebooks from 30 years ago that have answers to these really detailed questions we have. And it's just mind blowing. Uh, and we've learned a lot from that. And uh, I don't, we're, we're still struggling for that balance. Great. All right. Um, yeah. And so can, um, can Lauren, can I add something? Sorry certainly. about this. Yeah, because one of my worry is that um, you know, the way we store data or at the moment might not be very sustainable if you're thinking about very long, you know, time span. And so and there's a question of obsolescence as well. Uh, like for a lot of this research, we can do that because they were stored in notebooks that are physical and we can find them and read them again. And if we had stored this data on, you know, I don't know, floppy disk, <laughs> uh, those, this data will be lost somehow. And um, and I don't know, you know, can we store samples in freezers at minus 80 for 100 years? I don't think so. So I think maybe we should also be more, you know, <laughs> I think differently, like maybe we need to have, if we want to pass on some of this data, maybe we have to go a bit more low tech uh, in a way or or think about that because I think it's uh, it's not trivial actually. Yeah, really interesting. I heard one of the uh, talks yesterday too, talking about the environmental cost of a lot of this 
data storage. Like in a lot of ways, we want everything because we don't know what will be useful down the line. Um, but that makes it hard to find things. And certainly just that volume of data is, yeah, intimidating. So those are great points. Sounds good. Uh, Julian? And we should say uh, thanks for Julian for joining us, who works with uh, Liana on uh, the pollination resurvey we heard about. Yeah, so so this question sort of tied into you know what the frustrations and challenges were with the with the historical data set, and and the forefront of our mind was like, well, you know, what what do we want to collect? What do we what did we wish that Clements and Long collected? And uh, you know, of course, they didn't have things like you know GPS devices. Uh, but we do now and, you know, they're really cheap and you can get um, it just, you know, click a few buttons and then associated with each specimen, you can have really fine grain temporal and spatial data associated with it that can, you know, relatively easily be transferred onto the to the specimen. So th that's one of the things that we made sure that we uh, added and then, um, you know, following up on the comment you know, that information gets transferred onto the museum label. So that's sort of the, the low tech, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, data associated with the specimen. So having the museum specimen data and the fines uh, resolution, temporal and spatial data associated with the samples make it so valuable because you can, um, now, I'm sure 100 years from now, they probably would wish that there was something else that we didn't think of associated with the specimen. But that's that's something that we uh, we made sure that we that we had that we wish that the historical data had. Great. And Malin? Yeah, I just want to respond a little bit or to Ophelia's great points. You know, one I guess one thing I just want to highlight is that um, there are, you know, there are some really good resources out there that the community has started to come together around about how to store an archive data long term. You know, services like Zenodo or Figshare provide a way to get things off individual computers out of individual lab groups um, for broader use and archiving. Um, and I think it's important that we sort of continue to support and build those out. It doesn't address the environmental questions that you <laughs> you brought up, uh, Lauren. You know, it's not, they're not complete solutions and you need careful documentation and metadata to go along with them. So they're actually useful. Um, and, you know, I think the role of museums in long-term archiving of samples is incredibly important. Dried samples in, in, in addition can be a really good source for many, many species, um, not just freezing. Great. Seema, people should feel free just to speak up too. Yeah, one last um, thought is just, I'm not suggesting this in any sort of gatekeeping kind of way, but having someone who's interested possibly in taking over, you know, that, that long-term project when your career is coming to an end seems really important and valuable. And so, um, yeah, I can think of a, a few like long-term ecological monitoring projects that where people have purposefully sort of had this in mind as they get towards the end of their careers. And that seems like a really good way to ensure that it's carried forward and yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. And I guess I would say, you know, thinking about this functional approach, uh, we're sort of at the period where people that were originally taking more of this functional data are now at or you know somewhat past retirement. Uh, and we a lot of that data was collected before archiving was uh, common. And so I feel like we are at risk of losing quite a bit of data. So one of the things we've been thinking about in this functional resurvey sphere is sort of having you know matching services where somebody says like, I have this great data um, in, in helping also you know, having partnerships to try to make some of that data better curated and available for the future could be intriguing to think about. Great, any other uh, questions, topics people wanna bring up, comments?
I might get a little little bit specific. So one of the things that I I think uh, you know is, is interesting and, and exciting is uh, you know the potential to to quantify you know interactions from historical like uh, species interactions. So I was wondering if uh, if Malin, with your data sets, you've thought about uh, you know can you get data on um, trophic interactions between these uh, these species and do you think there might be uh, you know, changes in, in food webs or something that you could quantify? That's a, yeah, it's a really interesting question. The, these fish in particular, we haven't looked at it. I mean, it would require full guts, you know, that they would have, you know, the like historical specimens that were collected have gut contents available. And we, we haven't looked carefully for that in the historical specimens so far. A lot of them were very young, um, especially we've been focused on the lots that have large numbers of specimens, which tend to be the younger, smaller specimens. So it's been a, it would be a bit of a challenge with the, the albatross recollection project in particular, but Maya Zeff, who's just started a PhD um, with me at University of California at Santa Cruz, is really interested in, in that question. And she's done a lot of work in the Galapagos and it's not, it doesn't have quite the temporal, temporal, the temporal depth, but uh, she's trying to compare gut contents across marine fishes, both spatially across a temperature gradient from warm to cool. Uh, it's driven by upwelling in the, in the Galapagos, but then also between uh, La Nina and El Nino conditions or warmer and cooler conditions across that to understand to what extent these, these food webs are being rewired um, with environmental changes. And also whether that we, how much can we learn from the spatial gradient? And does that help us understand the temporal changes as well? I think it's a really cool question. Great, yeah, I, I'd agree. And I'd add, you know, we get quite a few questions about using like isotopes or elemental composition or something like that to um, assess interactions. And I haven't seen too much of that, but that seems something really promising to think about as some of these techniques become more readily available as well. Yeah, I guess maybe just the the broader comment that I feel like one of the one of the challenges is how do we start to integrate across these mechanisms because species do have so many different ways of adapting. You know, to what extent is it is plasticity enough? Is evolution required? Um, do how, to what extent do changing species interactions compensate for changes in the in the environment, um, either by exacerbating them or or maybe mitigating the the physiological consequences of changing. The changing environment. So systems where we can start to integrate those different perspectives are especially useful. Yeah, I agree. And also the point um, Seema talked about quite a bit, like when is it good news when you don't see change and indicates resilience and when not. So I think those multiple integrative perspectives will be really important for this winner and loser kind of framework. One of the other things I guess I, I think about a lot, and I, this is a question for Liana and maybe for Julian as well, just, you know, to what extent if we, when we have, you know, so, so much of our research has to be based in a place, because that's where the historical records were, but then to what extent, you know, for example, if there are lost species interactions in one place, have they just maybe are being uh, still realized, but somewhere else, maybe at a higher elevation, um, you know, Simo, what was cool about your study is to be able to look across that spatial gradient, um, but also somewhat a, a unique, unique case. But we have both space and time and phenology, these different, different dimensions that species can adapt within. Yeah, it's something that we've considered a lot. Uh, and also, you know, even within an elevational band with, you know, changes in, you know, occurrences and phenology, due to things like aspect can can change a lot. And that's why it's so um, critical to have that fine uh, spatial resolution data to know, you know, you know, maybe at a certain elevation, uh, you know, you, you don't, you might not see uh, shifts because they're, 
you know, plants are occurring in a different uh, microsite or there are shifts that are in phenology that might be compensated by the species occurring at a mo more favorable uh, microsite that might mask some of those, those changes. Great. All right. Well, I guess we've officially uh, reached the end of our discussion time, but um, I'm sure if people have specific questions, so people can probably st some people can probably stick around for a bit. But just to make sure, we thank all the uh, participants. It was really fun to hear all of this amazing work, uh, and hopefully, we'll we we will succeed in catalyzing some of these uh, functional resurvey kind of studies. I think it's clear. Hopefully, there's a lot of potential, um, and also. There will be a special issue of the American Naturalist coming out to encapsulate all of this work. So hopefully people will stay tuned to that. And yeah, thanks everyone for participating, all your great questions today and your interest. Thanks, Lauren, for bringing us, bringing us all together. Yeah, <laughs> yeah thank you, Lauren. Yeah, thanks. A lot of people stuck with us in this virtual world today. It was great. <laughs> yeah, it was great to see. Yeah. Yeah, really, really nice talks, everyone. It's cool to hear about the research. Yeah, I really enjoyed everyone's talks as well. It's great. Quite the diversity of critters and approaches. It's pretty cool. <laughs> exactly. All right, still some people sticking around. We'd be ha very happy if you have any questions. And thanks so much for joining and giving your input as well, Julian. Fun to have two people from that team. Yeah, my pleasure. Lauren, I had one question for you, um, part because I was doing drop off for my kids at camp and have missed little bits of your talk. Um, do you know the genetic basis for wing coloration? It seemed like that might be known. Yeah, um, we've always assumed that it's pretty complicated uh, and that's been sort of the party line. So we haven't gone there, um, but with increasing accessibility of a lot of these genomic tools, we're starting to reconsider that. Um, some other groups and other taxa have found still pretty complicated, but um, understanding more about the genetic underpinnings. Um, yeah, I'd be excited to talk to you about ideas. So for when we're doing these field selection studies, um, we're gonna try, we manipulate phenotype to do the experiment. So we're gonna try to compare gene expression between the different manipulated phenotypes to see if we can see the mechanisms of stress response. Or I guess I thought that was what we were doing. And now uh, there, we have a lot of discussion about whether we should try to more go at the um, genetic mechanism of melanism itself in these different contexts. So we're, uh, yeah, still puzzling that out, but bringing in more genetics is really exciting. Yeah, there's and been I'll a lot say, of progress uh, on yeah, wing coloration and genetics and butterflies. And it's been cool to see just the literature take off. Yeah, it, exactly you're right. A lot of it is that. quite complicated. It is great. And I'll say with uh, Julian participates some in this grasshopper resurvey uh, we do. So we are trying to look at genomics over time in those museum specimens. And that's really exciting, but it, it's pretty hard with dried insects to get out the genomic data. Um, but also that's a real area that people are having much more luck now. Um, so hopefully that will take off. And like you were saying, if you will get more genomic information out of the dried specimens, that's really gonna help. Lauren, can you get like uh, chemistry or like, do you know like what the, you know, the dark pigment, like what the chemicals and, you know, where they, where they come from in the, in the butterflies? Yeah, we're lucky because they are um, very simple pigments, either like melanin or pteridine, at least in the coleus. Um, so we could look more into the biochemistry. It's a good idea. We haven't thought of trying it. We'll think more about it. Great.
we've got people just hanging on because they're not, <laughs> not terribly <laughs> they're not here yeah yeah i love that the people that hang on just to see what you want to talk about well that's great well maybe we should uh call it then and uh yeah thanks so much everybody and we will uh yeah look forward to staying in touch as we develop these papers for the special issue and hopefully people will get in touch with us if they have any questions things they want to chat about ideas and thanks so much, Emily, for thanks. being our uh, tech support, sticking around. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Emily. Great hey, to see you thanks all. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.